but Ed. Thanks, Sean. I'll, I'll see what I can do with Claire Coutinho and encourage her uh, to, to come and give a speech. And um, look, I, I want to start by saying the, how grateful I am to Green Alliance for this uh, invitation. And I want to thank you, Sean, for what I think can only describe as br brilliant leadership of Green Alliance uh, over a number of years. Uh, you have made the compelling, essential, pragmatic case for climate action and uh, really grateful to you. And I want to thank Roz for her excellent presentation. I would describe it as a sort of nerd's paradise. Uh, and, that, and that means all of you uh, and, and me uh, 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 as well. Um, uh, look, my case to you today is that the election we're going to have uh, probably this year um, uh, on, is the most important election on climate and energy uh, that this country has ever seen. Because of the moment in which we are living because of the contrasting offer between the two main parties and the opportunity that making the transition offers our country, and because of the global implications of our election, Britain is at the front line of the climate fight at a moment in which many, many countries across the world are deciding whether to accelerate action or turn away from it. And I want to make the case for acceleration. Let me start by talking about the moment we're in. I think it's become too easy to treat the disturbing, the distressing, the abnormal as the new normal. Just imagine for a minute visiting 2024 from, say, 2014, a decade ago, and seeing where we are. And I think this is a problem about our debate on climate. Last month was the warmest February on record globally making it the ninth month in a row with record temperatures for the time of year. It was 1.77 degrees centigrade warmer than pre -industrial, the pre-industrial average and 0.81 degrees centigrade above even 1991 to 2020 levels. Global sea surface temperatures are at their highest ever recorded. 2023 was a record-breaking year for temperature and the nine warmest years on record have all occurred since 2014. And we see the effects all around us, wildfires, droughts, floods. I noticed yesterday in the news that South Sudan says it's closing its schools for two weeks because of an extreme heat wave. If we'd seen all this from the vantage point of a decade ago, we would not have shrugged, we would have been shocked. Yet the danger today is that we do the political equivalent of shrugging. Now that is the gloomy part uh, of where we are. But there are some other things that we would not have known in 2014, a decade ago, that would have made us more optimistic. That today for the majority, and it's important we say these things, that today for the majority of the world, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. That the costs of solar would fall almost 90% over the decade. And as a result, while the first terawatt of solar took 70 years to install, the next will only take three, that the costs of batteries would fall 80 per cent, that the costs of offshore wind power would by 2022 have fallen by 70 per cent, and that all of this, and this is a crucial point of, this, of my remarks, that all of this would mean that the climate case was no longer simply about doing our long-term duty to future generations, but about doing the right thing now for today's generations. Because this is the 2024 case for climate action. Renewable energy is now the cheaper as well as the cleaner choice. Clean power is the only route to energy security. We should obviously know that from what has happened to us since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which shows that our dependency on fossil fuels leaves us at the mercy of petrostates and dictators. And we also know more clearly than ever that climate offers a chance of the economic transformation that the British people, including in my constituency in Doncaster, have been crying out for. This is the single biggest economic opportunity of our generation. According to the IEA, globally, net zero could create as many as 17 million net new jobs by 2030 alone. So the way I would put it is this is the climate paradox that we face today. Dangerous climate change is accelerating, 
and we are simply not doing enough. And yet, at the same time, we can be so much more confident that we have the solutions and so much more confident about the benefits in bills, jobs and security of going faster, not slower. So our election comes at the most critical time for climate ever in our history. That takes me to the second part of my remarks, which is about the election choice between the two main parties that lies before us. Let, let me start with what we will offer the electorate. And this has been about four years of work with, between myself, Keir, and Rachel. With Keir's leadership, we have hardwired our mission to make Britain a clean energy superpower into a core part of our plan to change our economy. And it's really, really important to say this before I say something about policy. It is one of Keir's five missions for government. I don't think a leader before has made that as central to their pitch. And it's core to Rachel's growth agenda, symbolised by the fact that it's for climate investment that she's recruited the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, to advise us. Now, understandably, there has been much debate following the scaling back of our 28 billion commitment. But people should be in no doubt about the ambition of our agenda. So I want to lay it out to you today. We're committed to a decarbonised power system by 2030, the linchpin of a zero carbon economy. That is the leading commitment of any major country across the world. We're committed to no new North Sea oil and gas licenses while continuing to use existing fields, the first G7 oil and gas producing country to make this commitment. We will set up a new publicly owned energy generation company for the first time in 70 years in Britain, Great British Energy, capitalised at £8.3 billion. Through Great British Energy, we're committed to the largest expansion of community energy and ownership in our country's history, investing £3 billion over the Parliament. We'll invest over £7 billion in a national wealth fund to protect and create jobs across our country in steel, automotive, renewables, and through port investment, hydrogen, and carbon capture. <coughs> We will specifically, for the first time in a long time in Britain, reward companies that manufacture in our industrial heartlands and coastal communities with a new British jobs bonus, finally ensuring that greater clean power in our country produces the jobs alongside it. We will double the planned investment in warm homes, investing £13.2 billion over the next Parliament, plus the eco-scheme on top to slash fuel poverty, the largest ever investment in home energy efficiency in our history. And all of this is additional to existing planned public investment in the net zero transition. And this catalytic public investment will crowd in tens of billions more in private investment. On top of this, we're committed to be the first major financial centre in the world. And I was talking to Amanda Blank from Aviva about this yesterday. We're committed to be the first major financial centre in the world to introduce mandatory 1.5 degree aligned transition plans for financial institutions and major companies. I think this is a world-leading agenda, more central to our story of how we will change the country than at any previous election. A story of lower bills, job security, and protecting the planet. If I can put it this way, going back to my 2014 analogy, if Labour's leader from 2014 had travelled forward a decade, he would have compared today's policy agenda very favourably with the offer he was making back then. <laughs> Now, of course, now, of course, we want to do more. Uh, and this goes to the presentation that we heard from Ros. The, the second part of our mission is to accelerate to net zero. So the first part is about clean power. The second part is about accelerating to net zero. Across transport, nature, public buildings, resource efficiency, we know we need to take far greater action to meet our carbon budgets and our international NDC commitment for 2030. And in particular, I want to say to the many people in the room who care about this and the many people outside the room who care about this, there can be no solution to the climate crisis without action on nature. The threat to biodiversity is profound, the urgency as great as on carbon emissions, and indeed the solutions as clear and as positive. By acting on nature, we're not just helping wildlife thrive or preventing climate change, but can ensure a better future for our farmers, good jobs, access to green spaces, healthier environments, and cleaner air. And I'm delighted to be working with my brilliant colleague, Steve Reid, who has shown massive drive in the first few months. He's been the Shadow Secretary of State for DEFRA. I can guarantee to you we're working closely together in the time before the election, and we'll have more to say on nature in our manifesto. Here and I were at COP28, and I saw once again how much the world's climate leaders want British leadership, 
and how much the absence of that leadership was deeply apparent. This is the result of a government that has too often done the wrong thing at home, and we've seen it multiple ways, and lectured others about doing the right thing abroad. And people see it for what it is, which is being two-faced. And people call it out, and it undermines our ability to negotiate. You see, in climate, the power to persuade comes from the power of example. And that's what Labour will show if we win. On clean power, on fossil fuels, on financial rules, on ambition. And if Labour wins the general election, it will help galvanise global action and send a signal that a climate agenda laser-focused on bills, jobs and security can help progressives win. And let, let, let me end my speech on a more personal note. Uh, some of you may know that I was leader of the Labour Party and lost the election in 2015. I came back to frontline politics because of how much I care about this agenda. A sense of responsibility in part and a sense of possibility too. We know that we are shortly entering the second half of what is the decisive decade and we are far behind where we need to be. The chance to help make a positive contribution to the climate fight is something I could never and would never pass up. And at the same time, we know much more than we did a decade ago that we have the solutions in front of us. And that gives me a great sense of possibility, dare I say even excitement. Of course there are big challenges, but I am really inspired by what we can achieve as part of a genuine national mission. Government setting the direction, breaking down the barriers and investing. Business providing the ingenuity, ideas and resources. Investors with the tens or even hundreds of billions of pounds in private investment we need. Civil society holding government and business to account. Citizens mobilising to act and pressuring government to do so. This notion of a national mission is not some slogan. It is a reality about Keir, Rachel, what Keir, Rachel and I want to do if we win the election. And we are working to be day one ready if we form a government. If you care about this agenda, recognize the stakes of this election. If you care about this agenda, fight for it. If you care about this agenda, call out the conservatives when they dissemble, delay, and deny. And then together, if Labour wins the election, let's write a new chapter of British climate leadership for lower bills, energy security, good jobs, and protecting the fates of future generations to come. Thank you very much.